Hi, I'm Eric Connick. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Washington in Seattle, and I'm also co-chair of the AMP Professional Relations Committee. I'm going to be talking about some of the past and current policy proposals related to laboratory developed procedure regulation. So currently there are two pathways for uh, test regulations in the United States, and they break down basically by, um, is there a manufacturer involved or is the test developed and offered from just a single laboratory? So if a test is offered from just a single laboratory that has uh, developed and validated the test, it's regulated under the CLIA amendments, uh, which are promulgated by the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And again, the, the big difference here is that this is a test that's developed and validated in a single laboratory for use on patients that are tested within that lab. And this is in contrast to the, the in vitro uh, diagnostic tests, which are manufactured tests. So these are tests that are made by a company, they're boxed and they're shipped uh, generally across state lines, uh, sold for profit and then implemented within laboratories. And this group of tests also includes things like companion diagnostics. So these are diagnostic tests that have gone through the FDA approval process in tandem with a drug and have a specific uh, indication on their label. One thing to note is that once those uh, IVDs are brought into a clinical laboratory, the, the CLIA uh, rules apply. And so the laboratory has to verify the, the test within their laboratory, and then anything that they modify within the laboratory falls under the scope of CLIA. The, the current state of things uh, really started to change in about 2014. And this is when the FDA released some guidance uh, related to how they wanted to regulate laboratory developed tests going forward. And uh, they did this through a guidance document and then had numerous public hearings and meetings and sought feedback from uh, all the different stakeholders. And then by 2016, the, the agency decided that they weren't going to pursue this particular route for um, bringing regulation uh, changes to the market. And so at that point, the discussion has switched from uh, FDA releasing guidance to legislation. So this is you know, uh, laws that have, go through the congressional process, uh, go back and forth between the House and Senate and potentially would be passed by uh, a president. And so this is really broken down into two distinct proposals. So one is the, the Verifying Accurate and Leading Edge IVCT Development Act or VALID Act and the Verified Testing in American Laboratories or the VITAL Act. So the VALID Act it um, springs from a previous uh, legislation that was introduced uh, several years prior. And uh, the FDA did what was called technical assistance. So they offered um, their thoughts on this, this prior legislation. And what was interesting about this is that the way the FDA did this is they did their recommendations and their thoughts in the form of legislation. And so uh, that is what became the Valid Act. And so it's gone through a couple of rounds um, in the, the House and Senate so far. But what's interesting is that even though it was introduced back in 2018, it really hasn't changed very much with uh, just a couple of notable exceptions. So a lot of the, the talk around legislation has centered around this particular bill, just because it's been around for several years. So what does the Valid Act do? And so the, the key part of the Valid Act is that it brings everything, all laboratory tests, whether they're laboratory developed procedures or uh, in vitro clinical tests under the same umbrella. And this is a risk-based umbrella system. And so the, there are two risk classifications, low risk and high risk. And this is different from how things currently operate where uh, the current regulations through FDA have a three risk system, a low, medium, and high. And so another interesting thing about this particular legislation is that it would preempt all the other uh, regulatory frameworks that are out there. So, so several states, including Washington State and New York State, have their own regulatory frameworks in place for laboratory tests. Those wouldn't be uh, allowed under uh, the Ballot Act. Uh, New York State, which has a uh, assay qualification system that's currently in place for, for many, many years, uh, could have that same role in the future, but acting as a surrogate for the FDA. So again, as part of the Valid Act, uh, a new category of medical devices would be created, and these would be in vitro clinical tests, or IVCTs. That's actually in the name of the Valid Act. And again, it includes both laboratory developed tests as well as these box and shipped kits. And uh, there is a technology certification pathway that is 
uh, proposed within the Valid Act. The interesting thing is that it only applies, it, it, it's not sure what test that's gonna apply to because the low risk tests don't need to have a, a pre-certification pathway and the high risk tests are specifically excluded from using the pre-certification pathway. So it's really unclear how this, this technology pre-certification would actually work uh, in practice and, and who it would apply to. Um, it's also fairly restrictive in, in how individual tests would um, serve as exemplars uh, for a whole category of technologies. So there's a lot to be worked out there. Um, and the other part that's really important is that this, this act would um, create a public database that would be used for multiple different things. So including uh, access to the public so they can see information about the tests as well as applying uh, for certification from, from the agency for these tests. So, uh, and also for adverse uh, event reporting as well. So, you know, some, some big questions have come up with the Ballot Act. And so one of the big things is, is what would happen with all the tests that are currently being offered? Um, and there's pretty extensive grandfathering provisions within uh, the Ballot Act as it currently stands. And so most tests that are currently in use could fall under this grandfathered provision. Um, you know, there is some limited scope for tests being modified uh, with a couple of provisions. And so, the big provision is that it doesn't result in a new in vitro clinical test. And then the way that this happens is that it wouldn't have, any changes wouldn't affect the analytical uh, accuracy or clinical validity. Uh, it wouldn't change what the intended use or, or what the uh, specific indication for this test is. Um, it also wouldn't uh, allow anything that uh, got that test outside of mitigating measures that were currently in place, and then you know safety of a, a specimen collection system. So th there is a way to provide testing going forward. You know, notably the thing to think about is that a lot of the laboratory developed tests that are in use are in use because it's in a very fast uh, changing area of medicine, and so these tests tend to be updated quickly, and you know the performance changes over time because we recognize that we have different things that we need to offer our, our patients and our uh, clinicians. And so that, that would actually cause a lot of our tests to be quote unquote frozen in time, uh, even though they are grandfathered and are uh, available. Um, any tests that were already approved could be uh, become approved IVCTs, uh, either right at the time of enactment or three years later. It, it really would depend on what the manufacturer wanted and what their strategy was there. Um, investigational devices or I investigational device exemptions, IDEs, would become investigational IVCTs. And then the other thing that's really interesting is that, that there's a, some rules around instrumentation. And so currently, a lot of the instrumentation that's used in clinical laboratories is not specifically approved for in vitro clinical diagnostic use. And um, th that's been historical for many, many years. And manufacturers haven't um, created instrumentation that is, has that specific labeling and gone through the FDA. But within the Valid Act, there is a provision saying that you can use whatever instrumentation that you want for five years. And then at the end of that five year period, whatever instrumentation you have to use, you're going to be using has to be approved as such by uh, FDA under the provisions of the Valid Act. And so, you know, which really brings up this really interesting uh, possibility where we have tests that are grandfathered that are using grandfathered instruments, for example, and then five years down the line, uh, a flip. Uh, switch flips, and we can't use those anymore. And there, there may or may not be comparable instruments that are available. And so, you know, thinking about uh, a very large potentially hidden cost in, in this legislation, uh, that that instrumentation provisio is uh, is really concerning. So th there's other other components of the valid act. So as I mentioned, um, this is really putting manufacturer kits and professional services under the same regulatory umbrella. And as part of that, the FDA would like uh, the quality systems regulations to apply very, very specific ones. And what's interesting is a lot of the, the, the QSRs actually overlap with uh, things that are already in CLIA. And there's a lot of differences in terms of documentation and some specificity in the QSRs. And the QSRs are really designed for manufacturers. Um, and so that'll be interesting to see how laboratories that are uh, providing professional service would adapt to that particular uh, aspect of the law. Uh, there's also issues with labeling and labeling requirements. So if you're offering a service, how do you label that? Um, you know, it's, it's basically a statement on a website or in a report um, rather than a, a physical label on a product. Uh, 
Um, adverse event reporting uh, could be challenging because there's very specific reporting criteria. Uh, if a specific laboratory test is involved in uh, harm to a patient, death of a patient, that type of thing. And you know, oftentimes the, the patients that we see, especially at, at tertiary medical centers like the one I uh, work in, you know, we, the, the patients are complex and it's hard to say, you know, was a laboratory test uh, a part of the reason why a particular patient died? Um, and so that's going to put a lot of onus on the laboratory for reporting that to the FDA and, and working through things. Also, as part of the, the Valid Act, there's a, a post-market surveillance uh, requirement. And so laboratories would be required to uh, monitor the performance and, and the safety of their devices, um, which is something that most laboratories really are set up to do currently. Uh, and then there's uh, provisions for emergency use authorization. And the initial version of the Valid Act was fairly prescriptive, and the most recent version looks much more like what we've seen for the last 18 months or so uh, in the COVID pandemic. And so um, the, the EUA provisions are um, much more usable than they were, but I think all of us who've done this for the last uh, year and a half have recognized that there are huge shortcomings even in, in the quote unquote streamlined system that we've been operating under. So the other important thing is that you know, in this, uh, you know, 100 plus pages of legislation, there's no provision at all to update CLIA. So as I mentioned, there, there are multiple areas of overlap um, where laboratories are going to essentially have to be doing, you know, double the work to fulfill both their CLIA mandates for their operations, as well as anything that the FDA um, puts in place. So there's a lot, uh, again, a lot of overlap and, and the details are still being worked out. So you know, we, we think we have an idea of what the laboratory uh, would be looking like underneath the valid, but, you know, again, um, the, we wouldn't necessarily know until after um, the regulations are promulgated after uh, such legislation is passed. So in contrast, the, the VITAL Act, uh, this is a more recent development. And so this is something that really narrowly focuses on laboratory developed procedures um, and uh, was introduced in 2020. And the Vital Act is actually fairly simple. And so uh, it, there's essentially three parts. So the first part is that laboratory developed procedures are professional medical service and the regulation of those professional medical services falls under the auspices of CLIA uh, within CMS. The second part is that um, you know, we recognize that uh, CLIA needs to be updated. It's been uh, several decades since it was updated. And so you know, very quickly after passage of this legislation, it would mandate uh, public comments and meetings to establish, you know, what are the things that we should be considering in an update to CLIA. And then the final part is actually looking at, you know, how laboratory developed tests were used during the early days of the pandemic and, and how regulations impacted our uh, ability to use those to care for our patients. And so, you know, I can speak uh, very uh, well to what happened here in Washington State, where uh, the regulations, the, the EUA regulations prevented us from testing patients uh, weeks earlier than we were able to test. And um, it wasn't because there was a lack of demand or there was the test wasn't safe or something like that. It really was just uh, the, the regulatory choices uh, that you know, our tests were not available to our patients um, that we were caring for. And so as a result, we probably missed um, the early uh, spread of COVID in our, our population here in Washington State. So uh, with that, you can talk about uh, valid and vital, and I'll pass that off.